Well, hello, uh, men and women of Prince George Church, and thank you for joining us for our next installment of Adult Bible Study, the online edition. Um, if you have your Bibles, uh, open up to 2 Kings chapter 7, the next chapter that we'll be in, and we'll go through it together. And uh, before we do, if you would please pray with me. This is a colic that I try to pray uh, before um, every uh, Bible study. It is from uh, the Book of Common Prayer, page 676. Um, and it's simply called, Before the Reading of Scripture. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Second Kings chapter 7 is where we are. And this, uh, remember, it's picking up um, kind of in the middle of a story um, that uh, uh, chapter 6 started. Um, remember that we're in kind of desperate times in Israel at the moment. Um, so a quick uh, setting of the context for this chapter. Remember Samaria, that is the capital of Israel, uh, that is the northern tribes, uh, the ten northern tribes of the divided kingdom. Uh, Samaria is under siege uh, by an old enemy named Syria and its king, Ben-Hadad. Um, remember that in ancient warfare, sieges um, had a way of quickly devastating the local economy. And that's exactly where we are in this situation. Um, on top of this siege, actually, is a famine, which means that resources, provision, food is even more scarce uh, than normal. And so prices for even unclean things that people shouldn't or in most circumstances would never eat, like a donkey's head, are astronomically high. Um, and that's if you can afford it. And if not, people have resorted, as we've seen last chapter, um, to actually eating children, eating other human beings. Things are very, very dire. Um, as desperate as it can get, in, in a sense. Uh, remember, the last thing that has happened um, was that the messenger of a king of Israel uh, kind of confronted Elisha. Elisha knew he was coming. And this messenger, and here's a, kind of a key point, this messenger blames God for this disaster. Um, we've seen this time and time again. Um, the kings, the leadership of Israel and Judah sometimes, um, will often blame God for the circumstances that they're in, when in fact, this is a, a reversal of, of the truth, um, the, the circumstances that they're in are always a result of their rebellion and unfaithfulness um, and their sin, their idolatry. Um, and so we've seen time and time again, the people will turn their backs and blame God um, or his prophet, his messenger, uh, when the very opposite is actually the case. And so we pick up the story with Elisha's response to this is Israelite messenger. So chapter 7, verse 1, But Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time a seah of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Notice that phrase, the word of the Lord. We've seen it time and time again. It's a prominent theme throughout the whole book of Kings. Um, it's one of the fundamental tensions of the whole book, um, especially as, a, as revolves around the prophets, um, whether the people, the king in particular, is going to believe the prophet and the word of the Lord, that is, uh, I think, equivalent basically to having faith in Yahweh, or disbelieve the prophet uh, when he speaks on God's behalf. Um, so that's one of the primary tensions. Uh, whenever the word of the Lord comes, are the people, is the king going to believe, have faith in Yahweh and his word, or not? And more often than not, as we've seen, they don't have that faith. Of course, from a biblical perspective, the question is never about the prophecy from God being fulfilled. That's going to happen no matter what. It's not a matter of if the prophecy is going to come true, um, but rather uh, just what will that look like and when will it happen? And this particular prophecy has a very specific content, um, a very specific time frame, and a very specific understanding of what it's going to look like. It says, tomorrow about this time, that is within 24 hours, um, a seah of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel. That is, that the economic circumstances, the devastation that this siege and this famine have brought about are going to be reversed in dramatic fashion. Um, they're going to be completely and utterly reversed. Um, and and as, uh, as you can imagine, this is a, an amazing thing to predict. 
um, uh, the economy could never recover that quickly on its own. Um, in fact, according to one commentator, these prices that they are describing um, is not just going back to normal, but it's actually these are bargain prices. That is that uh, fortunes are going to be reversed so drastically that there's going to be an abundance of um, economic blessing um, that will be provided. And so it sounds uh, a lot uh, to the average person and certainly to the king and to the messenger. It sounds like it's too good to be true. Um, and uh, when the last story showed that people were desperate enough to eat children, um, when you say that things are going to turn around so drastically that not only will you not have to do that anymore, but um, normal wheat and normal barley is going to go back to bargain prices. It does sound a little bit too good to be true, but here's the trick, here's the thing. This is a direct prophecy from the Lord. And so, as we've seen throughout uh, uh, the book of Kings, um, God's word comes true no matter what. And so you'd think that Israel and the king and uh, the people, uh, knowing the previous stories of every time God promises something, it happens. You'd think that they um, would be able to believe it, uh, and yet that's not the case. Um, uh, so uh, just a quick note on this, uh, this phrase, at the gate of Samaria, city gates of the ancient Near Eastern world, were located next to an open plaza where citizens conducted business transactions and handled legal matters. It's basically where the market was formed, and so um, it's also the first place that a siege uh, would uh, take over, would try to block off from outside resources. So it's, it's a very important point for the city. Um, basically, economic life and life in general in Samaria is going to go back to normal and even be in a blessed state by this time tomorrow. Again, it sounds too good to be true, and that's exactly what the messenger of Israel uh, treats it as. Verse 2, Then the captain on whose hand the king leaned said to the man of God, If the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? But he said, that is Elisha said back to him, You shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Uh, this phrase, windows in heaven, it could refer to either provision of rain or um, this idea that some Israelites had, and we see it in the Old Testament in a few places in Psalms and Micah, um, or uh, excuse me, Malachi, uh, this idea that uh, figuratively speaking, God has storehouses in heaven from which he dispenses material blessings. Um, if you ever hear about the storehouses of God up in heaven, that's the idea going on there. Um, so if this refers to rainfall, the objection here is that God, even if he brought rain that very day, um, no grain could, be, could, could grow soon enough and uh, be harvested soon enough for such prices to be brought back to normal by tomorrow. Or it's simply a doubt um, uh, on the part of the messenger that God can bring about such economic, such material blessing. Um, either way... Uh, the messenger is mocking God and his promise and his word in unbelief. And so Elisha makes a further prophecy, a further prediction, that the messenger, the captain, is going to see the miracle happen, but he's not going to benefit from it personally. Uh, but the question still remains, right, how is that going to happen? The prophecy's out there. Um, God has made it. He's sent it to his people through his prophet. But how is that going to take place? And the rest of the chapter tells that story. Uh, so in, in, in a somewhat humorous fashion, or maybe ironic fashion, verse 3, Now there were four men who were lepers at the entrance to the gate. They said to one another, Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say, Let us enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. So come now, let us go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare our lives, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. Um, they are at the entrance of the gate, and that's because lepers, uh, are those with skin diseases, um, according to Mosaic law, were forbidden to enter the city. That's in uh, Leviticus and in Numbers. Lepers are considered unclean until they are healed, if they are healed, uh, and even then they have to go through uh, a lot of rituals to get back into the city. And so um, they basically say, we can take our chances with the Syrians, because either we stay here and die, we go into the city and die, or we go to the Syrians, who obviously have enough... Um, economic and military power to be surviving at the moment to to put forward a siege and so um, we don't have anything to lose we might as well go to them and see if they'll let us live so verse 5 they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians but when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians behold there was no one there 
for the Lord had made the army of the Syrians, hear the sound of chariots and of horses, the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to come against us. So they fled away in the twilight and abandoned their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was, and fled for their lives. Here we find the heart of the explanation of the miraculous turn of events. Uh, the Syrians had fled, leaving everything that they had behind because God brought about a supernatural fear on them, tricking them into believing um, that Israel had gained some allies um, and that they were basically surrounded, and so they fled for their lives. Um, potentially, this is due to, remember last chapter, um, that God opens the eyes of Elisha's servant so he can see a spiritual army, probably angels, um, that are all around Israel, even in the midst of this battle. It's potentially the case that God caused these angelic armies to make this sound um, and thus make the Syrians flee. Um, whatever the case, notice how uh, this economic turn of events happens. Notice how these fortunes are reversed so drastically. The Syrians, in their haste to save their own lives, um, uh, they leave everything behind. And so that means that um, all of this plunder is free for the taking. And uh, the lepers at first help themselves. Verse 8, when these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent and ate and drank, and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. And they came back and entered another tent and carried off things from it and went and hid them. Um, so uh, the, the economic provision that Elisha had prophesied is there. It's there for the taking, even though no one yet knows about it, only these lepers do. First, they, uh, they take uh, not only enough for themselves, but more than enough for themselves. They actually go and, and hoard some. They hide some to secure some future economic blessing for themselves. But eventually they come to their senses and realize that all of Israel should partake of these benefits together. And so they go back to the country, to Israel, to the gate, um, and they share the good news. Verse 9, Then they said to one another, We are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until the morning, punishment will overtake us. Now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they came and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no one to be seen or heard there, but nothing but the horses tied and the donkeys tied and the tents, as they were. The gatekeepers called out, and it was told within the king's household. So um, they realized that they shouldn't simply... Uh, hoard all of this stuff for themselves, but they should go and share the good news with Israel, and so is all of Israel can be lifted out of these dire circumstances that they're in. Um, so they go and tell the gatekeeper, and the word eventually reaches the king's ears. Um, and it's interesting, the reaction of the king, um, instead of uh, being overjoyed that such a miracle had taken place, he first um, uh, responds with skepticism. The king rose in the night and said to his servants, I will tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we are hungry. Therefore, they have gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the open country, thinking when they come out of the city, we shall take them alive and get into the city. Uh, so ironically, the king of Israel thinks that this is um, a ploy, a plot by the Syrians to uh, end the siege with a victory for them. Um, again, the, the too good to be true assumption seems to be operative here. The king thinks this, this is too good to be true. There's no way that this happened. The Syrians must be tricking us. Not only did the king fail to lead God's people in victory by trusting the Lord, but he also refused to believe that the Lord had delivered his city even when Elisha, the prophet, had predicted it. And even when um, it's within his power to go out and uh, find out for himself whether or not what the lepers were saying, the good news they were sharing, was true. Thankfully, one of his servants um, kind of advises him and says, we have nothing to lose here, really, um, if we just send out a couple scouts to see if they're telling the truth. Verse 13, and one of his servants said, let some men take five of the remaining horses, seeing that those who are left here will fare like the whole multitude of Israel who have already perished. Let us send and see. Again, uh, the operating uh, logic here is um, just like the lepers, right? The lepers thought, well, we don't really have anything to lose. Let's go and try this. The servant says, we don't have much to lose. If, we, uh, if we're not out of the situation, 
um, were likely doomed for death anyway, and so let's just go and see, send out some scouts to see if what they say is true. Verse 14, so they took two horsemen, and the king sent them after the army of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. So they went after them as far as the Jordan, and behold, all the way was littered with garments and equipment that the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. And the messenger returned and told the king. Um, they find, as we've seen time and time again, they find things just as Elisha predicted, just as the prophet had said would happen. Um, they find things just also as the lepers had told them they would be. Um, the Syrians had run off and they were no longer a problem. They were no longer a threat. And not only that, they had left behind garments um, and equipment and horses and donkeys. Right now, Notice all of this wealth that is now immediately accessible is actually there for the taking for Israel. And so that's exactly what they do um, when they finally realize that the prophecy had come true, that the lepers weren't lying, that God's word had actually come true. They go out and enjoy the blessings. Verse 16, Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Syrians. So a seah of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Notice a word-for-word -word quote from verse 1 of the prophecy. We've seen this time and time again in these prophecy fulfillment stories where there's a prophecy that a prophet gives and a fulfillment immediately following. Um, there's often a word-to-word -word correspondence between the prophecy and the fulfillment. Um, the, these details kind of confirm and reconfirm over and over again uh, the trustworthiness, the surety of what God says. As God words, God's word says, so it happens. We've seen this time and time again. Uh, but that's not the only prediction. That's not the only prophecy that Elisha had made. It was the more prominent one, right? You're going to get out of this mess in a drastic fashion. The economy is going to completely reset back to not only normal, but better than average. Um, and here we see that's exactly what happens, and we see how it happens. But um, there's a secondary, kind of uh, smaller, if you will, prophecy that he makes, and that is that the captain, the messenger who had first been the one to mock and to doubt God's word, uh, was going to see the miracle but not enjoy it. Um, and so that's what the rest of this chapter relates, the story of that. Verse 17, the king had appointed the captain on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. Uh, right, so um, after he sees this miracle happen, he puts that man, the one who was doubting God right in front of Elisha, he puts him in charge of the gate, things going in and out. And the people, because they were so um, uh, excited and so uh, probably anxious about getting some of that wealth for themselves, the people trampled him in the gate so that he died. As the man of God had said when the king came down to him, for when the man of God had said to the king, two seahs of barley shall be sold for a shekel, and a seah of fine flour for a shekel, about this time tomorrow in the gate of Samaria, the captain, of the, the captain answered the man of God, If the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And he said, You shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And so it happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gate, and he died. Notice again, a word-to-word -word correspondence, a word-to-word -word quote. Um, the, the scriptures actually retells, in miniature fashion, retells the story of the doubting of the captain and the consequence that followed. These details, particularly those dealing with the death of the captain, were repeated in meticulous detail to highlight the fact that God is faithful. The unspoken lessons of God's reliable character were, number one, that people, particularly the king and his officers, should obey and trust God. And two, that God will care for his people when kings fail. And again, another thing that we've seen time and time again um, in the book of Kings is even when God's people are unfaithful to him, even when they doubt him, even when they um, don't believe in his word, even when they continue to rebel and continue to uh, go after idols um, and do all sorts of things, um, God continues to provide for them. Now, um, uh, you might say, well, what about this captain, right? He, he, he didn't get provided for, and that's true. God is under no obligation to provide for any of them, and this is why it's part of uh, a theme that we've seen. Um, there are moments in these stories where God chooses to emphasize his mercy and moments in these stories where he chooses to emphasize his 
justice, um, and, and either are his prerogative. He's allowed to do as he pleases, being God. He is perfectly merciful and perfectly just, um, and no one deserves his mercy, and everyone deserves his justice. And so when he chooses to do one or the other with anyone, it's not outside his character, um, and it's, it's not um, against some rule that he has to follow. Um, but we've seen time and time again when his people, when the king, um, when uh, any random contention of Israelites deserve his justice, might deserve to be treated in a sense like this captain of the guard, they are not, right? Instead, even though the people doubted him, even though the king doubted him, notice that, uh, the king is, is full of doubt throughout this, and yet God continues to provide for his people. And I think that's a comforting thing, right, even in our lives, that um, God's faithfulness to us is dependent on his word, right, on what he says he will do, not on our ability to obey and trust. Um, God, if he promises to do something for us, he will do it for us, no matter what, no matter our particular faith in that promise um, or the level of faith in that promise. Maybe it can wax and wane at times. But I find it very comforting, even though that might be a bit strange, um, this story that God's word always holds true uh, in the case of the, the captain of the guard, um, it can be and should be, I think, a comforting thing to us because um, our enjoyment of God's promises and his blessings is not dependent on our ability to uh, trust, to doubt, um, and to believe or disbelieve God. If we have faith in Jesus Christ, no matter if it's a good day for us or a bad day for us, God's promises and word to us in Jesus Christ is faithful and true, um, and we don't have to worry about God not keeping any promise that he makes. Um, we don't have to worry about God um, ultimately abandoning us um, because we are unfaithful to him. Um, God provides for his children in this story, for the king, for his people, even in the midst of their unfaithfulness and their rebellion and their idolatry and their lack of faith in him, he continues to provide for them. And I think over the long story of scripture, right, because um, we have to take this in the context of everything that God is doing in the Old Testament to move us forward to the story of Jesus, to get us to the point of the perfect king, the perfect Messiah who has perfect faith. Um, I think part of what God is doing here is using his faithfulness in the midst of people's unfaithfulness to bring them to a place of faith and faithfulness to him. So faith first and then faithfulness to him. And so I know that as we take these stories kind of chapter by chapter, we go them line by line, which I think is a very valuable thing, um, we can kind of get into this mode of, well, what if, what if I'm the captain? <laughs> what, if, what if God strikes me down in a moment of doubt? But if we take this story in the context of the whole of Scripture, um, I think part of what he's doing in these stories um, is leading his people back to a place of faith so that they would go into a mode of faithfulness. I mean, I, so I think um, that as we take this in light of the gospel and in light of everything that God is doing throughout the story of Scripture, uh, we don't have to fear being on the tail end of something like this captain. Um, and that, uh, that leads us to, I think, a couple of reflection questions for us and then a, uh, a lesson for us from this chapter. So the, the questions that I have uh, kind of go along with that theme. Um, so if you found yourself in this story overhearing, as it were, Elisha's prophecy of a miraculous turn of events in the span of just a day, um, uh, seemingly in a way that is too good to be true, is hard to believe, how do you think you would react? Uh, would you tend towards believing Elisha? Um, or would you tend towards questioning him, being skeptical, maybe like the messenger, the captain, or the king? Um, I can be honest and say that I would tend towards skepticism. I, I'm still, uh, my, uh, my faith in that area is, is a weakness. Um, I uh, am maybe a bit ashamed to admit, but I'm not afraid to admit that I know there's a place where I can grow in that faith. Um, and so I, uh, um, along with that admission, um, this is something for me and for you to reflect on. Uh, why do you think that is? Why do you think you tend towards believing? Or why do you think you tend towards uh, disbelieving? Um, uh, that strong faith in God's ability to perform the miraculous or a lack of, of that. And then what do you think you can do? What can I do? What can we do? Um, what can we pray for to grow in that faith? 
for God expecting, uh, excuse me, for us expecting that God can do amazing and miraculous things, that he can turn things around in a moment uh, if, he, if he would choose. Um, and again, this, this applies uh, to me just as much as anyone else. I, um, I tend towards skepticism. Um, and there, uh, there's, there's a moment there, I think. There's a, a lesson there of what can we do, what can we pray, um, where can we exercise more in a growing faith in God to turn things around, to do amazing things. Um, again, I, this, is, this is not, uh, these are not salvation terms. It's, I don't think if you have a weak faith in this sense like I do, that that means that you're not a Christian or anything like that. Um, I simply mean, right, I'm, this is in the context of believing in Jesus and being saved by Jesus and uh, the gospel saving you no matter what. Um, and yet, um, there are, uh, there's a relational aspect with us and God where we can grow in trust in Him, grow in believing that He can do as He says He can and He will do. And so I want us to think about what it looks like together, what it looks like to, to uh, grow into more of that faith. Um, the, the lesson that I pull from this chapter is simply this. Uh, too good to be true doesn't apply to God's blessings, and especially the gospel. The gospel is the ultimate blessing. It's the ultimate good news uh, that God himself took on humanity and took on our sin and died on a cross so that we uh, could be forgiven and come back into restoration, into fellowship. And it sounds, if you really thought about it, if we understood sin, if we understood God's holiness as we should, if we understood everything um, that we should about the gospel and the Bible, it should seem completely, utterly absurd, way too good to be true. And yet, uh, it's not. It is true. God really did do that. He really did reach down to save us. He really does love us. He really does want to bring us into relationship with himself and with each other. Uh, and so none of God's blessing, and, and there are some amazing promises, some amazing blessings that God promises to us, and some that are still to come, some uh, that look like a new heavens and a new earth. None of those blessings, and as amazing as they are and will be, none of them are too good to be true. Every single one of them is true in Christ. And they are all yes and amen in Him. And we can look forward to um, uh, just things beyond our wildest dreams and imaginations. Um, the blessings of the gospel extend from now until eternity. Um, and so uh, even if they sound, they seem, they feel too good to be true, and some days that can be a day-to-day -day thing. Sometimes we really believe the gospel and how amazing it is, and sometimes it's hard to believe, and that's okay. Um, the gospel really is true. God's promises to us really are true. They're not too good to be true. They're going to play themselves out. God will win in the end. He will do all according to his will, and we can trust in that, and that's a comforting thing. Uh, thanks for joining us. God bless you, and I hope to see you back here next week as we do chapter 8. God bless.